Good morning. Today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about altered feeding behaviors that are observed in disease vectors. A vector is any organism that functions as a carrier of an infectious agent between organisms of a different species. This can include mechanical vectors, like this housefly here, that move the causative agent of trichoma between hosts without actually getting infected with trichoma itself, and also biological vectors, for example, like this tick in the middle, in which the pathogen needs to undergo either obligate life stages within the vector, vector or multiple rounds of replication before it can be passed to a new host. For the most part, vectors are small ectotherms, and many of them are insects. Despite their small size, the diseases transmitted by these uh, group of organisms have an enormous impact on human health and livelihood, both because of their public health importance, but also because many of the important pathogens of plants um, and domesticated animals are also vector-borne, so it threatens food security as well. This is the r naught equation uh, that we use to think about vector-borne disease transmission and dynamics. And biting behavior, expressed as biting rate, is a key component of this um, equation. And it highlights the importance of feeding behavior in the transmission of these diseases. Across a stunning range of these systems, both plant and animal pathogens, there's evidence that infection alters feeding behavior. The system that I work in a lot of the time is uh, the mosquito malaria system. In this case, we have a pathogen that has several obligate life stages inside of the mosquito. Um, when the mosquito takes up an infectious blood meal, the parasite spends a long period of time developing inside of the mosquito's gut um, as an oocyst before it moves to the salivary glands as a stage called the sporozoite and becomes infectious. This development period, called the EIP or extrinsic incubation period, takes up a significant proportion of the female's lifespan. In this system, we also have evidence that infection um, alters host-seeking responses. So on the y-axis here, I have the proportion of females approaching a host, and on the x-axis, I have two time periods that represent that pre-infectious period when the oocyst is developing inside of the mosquito's gut, and that infectious period when the parasite is in the salivary glands and ready to be transmitted. If we look at uninfected mosquitoes of the same age, we see a pattern where they're fairly responsive in this assay early on and then become less responsive over time. This is likely due to senescence. If we compare that to infected mosquitoes that have received a blood meal containing a plasmodium ulli parasite, which is a rodent model malaria, we see a decreased response in their feeding behavior relative to controls in that first time period and an increased response during that infectious period, both compared to controls and to how this group was responding earlier on in the assay. These changes in behavior can be tied to the sensitivity of the mosquito periphery nervous system and are predicted to cause large increases in transmission. The reason that we see this increase in transmission is twofold. So first, it means that mosquitoes are biting at the time that the parasites are infectious which is a key part of transmission, but maybe not quite as intuitively, it's also important when the mosquitoes are not biting. And that's because transmission sits at the intersection of two life cycles, that long development period of the parasite, but also the discrete reproductive cycles that are tied to mosquito feeding behavior. So an infected female can undergo multiple feeds during the period that the parasite's developing before she's ever able to pass on the parasite. And these pre-infectious feeding cycles are associated with significant amounts of mortality. This leads to a pattern where females that skip these pre-infectious cycles are much more likely to survive the extrinsic incubation period. And um, in an experiment where we controlled when females were allowed to take blood meals, 
skipping the pre-infectious feeds led to a doubling in the number of females that survived EIP. If you feed this sort of information in through models, you find that you quickly get full changes in the number of infectious bites you expect a population to be able to deliver. As I mentioned before, these sorts of changes in behavior that are predicted to increase the probability of transmission are observed across a wide range of vector parasite combinations. Um, and changes in behavior affect things ranging from early components of feeding behavior, like the initiation of host seeking, all the way through to at host feeding behaviors like probing and determining the termination of feeding behaviors. If we look across a bunch of studies, generally we find that host seeking increases in infectious individuals, um, either measured by the proportion of individuals responding or the latency of that response. A shift in host choice, in some cases uh, between infected and uninfected individuals of the same species, and in some cases between different potential host species. At hosts, there's a consistent theme of an increase in the duration of a feeding event and the number of probes per feeding event. This is also associated in many cases with a decrease in feeding efficiency which in a few scenarios leads to predicted increases in multiple feeding where vectors bite more than one host per feeding event. Across all of these diverse systems and diverse behaviors, almost all of these changes are interpreted as parasite manipulation. And I think this is a really reasonable hypothesis. As we'll be discussing more over the next few days, Parasites clearly have the potential to alter a broad range of phenotypic traits in their hosts, extending from physiology to behavior. In many of the at-host feeding examples, there's really nice data demonstrating a clear mechanism by which pathogens are altering host behavior. And uh, I've put up a few studies that I think are good examples, but to sort of summarize, in many instances, there's good evidence that parasites either block um, or uh, damage the mechanisms that are used for feeding, and this is what leads to changes in probing duration and the efficiency of feeding behavior. These are kind of standout examples. In most cases, um, we lack a mechanism to explain how parasites are altering host behavior and we lack data on how changes in behavior are affecting, in some cases, parasite fitness. Um, we just imply that it increases transmission, but in many cases, we lack data on how the change in behavior affects host fitness and physiology. And that's because the effect of behavior on host fitness is not part of the definition of parasite manipulation. However, I think it's important for identifying the mechanistic basis of these behaviors and predicting how they're going to vary over time and space to consider the role of the host in these changes in behavior. So for example, in our uh, data looking at host seeking in malaria infected mosquitoes, we found that when we dissected this group in the red bars to determine which ones had actually been infected when they took that early infectious blood meal and which ones were simply exposed, that there was no difference between the behavior of infected and exposed individuals. And so this led us to further explore the role of the mosquito's own immune response in these changes in behavior. And when what we found was these changes in behavior were not only not specific to living parasites, they weren't even specific to plasmodium. A general immune challenge with dead bacteria produces a similar behavioral and neurophysiological phenotype to the one that we see with malaria infection. Moreover, this response is dose dependent, where the more dead bacteria we inject into mosquitoes, the less likely they are to respond to hosts six to eight days later, and then the more likely they are to respond 14 to 16 days later. This lack of specificity of this response and its dose dependency make these changes in behavior 
sound very similar to another group of infection associated changes in feeding behavior, which are called illness mediated anorexia. A popular explanation for these changes in behavior, almost all of which are in non vector systems, is that hosts alter their feeding responses and reallocate resources to optimize their ability to resist or tolerate infection. And I think this brings us back to this equation where the most of these parameters are components of vector life history. And moreover, all of these components affect one another. So changes in biting behavior are going to change mosquito survival, but also reproduction. Going back to our malaria example, we found that changes in uh, host seeking behavior could be tied to changes in expression of these insulin like peptides in the mid gut of mosquitoes. And these responded to both plasmodium infection, but also the heat killed E. coli. And these insulin like peptides are part of an insulin signaling system that's involved in balancing interactions between life history processes such as reproduction, immunity, and digestion. They've now been tied to both mounting the immune response and also feeding behavior. If we had ignored the role of the host, we probably would have not picked up on this potential mechanism. But what I think these experiments highlight more broadly is that we need to think about these changes in feeding behavior in a similar way that we do to other infection phenotypes which is that in many cases, there's important roles for both the pathogen and the vector host. And by doing this, I think we can gain better insight into the mechanistic basis and the eco-evolutionary dynamics of these behaviors. I'd like to acknowledge all of the many people who have worked on these projects. Um, and also I have put my email address up here again, um, so that if you're unable to catch me in a live virtual discussion, I'd be happy to